Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. Today, we have John Brown and Ira Harris. John is a distinguished former member of Britain's parliament who served on the Treasury Select Committee as chairman of the Conservative Small Business Committee and also as a principal advisor to the British government on issues relating to geopolitical matters. He has worked at Morgan Stanley as an investment banker, also working for other firms such as Barclays Bank and Citigroup. An IRA's independent trader, successful hedge fund manager, global macro consultant trading foreign currencies, bonds, commodities, and equities for over 40 years. He was also CME director from 1997 to 2003. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello, uh, Richard. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Richard. Uh, nice to uh, speak with you too, John. So, Richard, wherever we're going, take us there. Okay, let's start um, with your recent writings. Ira, you mentioned uh, uh, that there's a lot of stress building in the financial system as the Federal Reserve increases rates. And then you make reference to the potential for a Minsky moment, given uh, what you see as complacency leading to increased risk taking while using increasing leverage. Can you elaborate? Well, I'm just, you know, I was picking up from where uh, Mr. Joe, uh, who in October of 2017, when he, was, when he was the governor of the People's Bank of China, you know, made a comment to the, uh, to the Chinese uh, leadership that uh, the complacency around the world, and especially in China, with a huge amount of debt, was leading to a potential Minsky moment, as uh, it's come to be called. Uh, and I think uh, w the complacency that has settled in in the market now daily, and I see it, and uh, as a trader, it's very difficult because you're looking for things to do, but you're as an investor, you want to just sit and watch and go, wow, this is uh, getting more and more interesting. And when you, when you realize that global debt, global debt I'm talking about, totals uh, $230 trillion, which is uh, almost, it's probably about 2.8%, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, 280% of the, um, global GDP, and you realize how much debt has grown on these books, and then you see the weakening yuan. And in reference to that, and of course we've seen the yuan weakens, and the Chinese say it's, it's not us doing it by policy, it's happening you know, due to um, economic situations, and coupled with the yuan uh, weakness is of course uh, dramatic weakness in the Chinese uh, stock market. Now, that's something that we all have to be aware of because typically in a so-called emerging market, and we can debate whether China is really an emerging market or not, when you get weakening currency, you usually get uh, a rally in, equi in their equity markets, and that's not taking place. So that makes me be very leery about what Mr. Joe had to say back in, uh, in October because something has definitely happened. And I, I, it's not that my asset prices are so high, it's that they're high coupled with a, a, a vast amount of uh, debt being taken on to support the entire global financial system. And you have the Fed, of course, raising rates. That may, that's why I uh, allude to that. And John, do you see the same uh, as well happening in terms of uh, these factors? Yes, exactly. And I, I, just to emphasize what Ira said, a trillion, if you think back a trillion seconds, you're going back 31, just over 31,000 years. So if you had a trillion dollar bills to count, it would take you 31 and a half thousand years to count them. Uh, I mean, a trillion is an unfathomable number. And as Ira said, you know, $230 trillion of debt which is getting on for three times the earnings. I mean, who would lend to a company that had debt three times its earnings? 
Uh, I think what's happening now is what may could bring it to a head, and we're swimming in debt. I mean, students in America alone have $1.5 trillion of student loan debt. Uh, the debts are just staggering, and they've been increased entirely by the Fed leading the other world central banks and having uh, you know, quantitative easings and zero interest costs money. In fact, it was negative interest. Uh, you had to go out a few years ago, 10 years on a, corp, on a national bond, even for Italy, can you believe, 10 years to get a positive uh, net, a nominal return. If you took inflation off, it was way negative still. It, it's, it's incredible. And what's going to happen, I think, is could bring it to a head, is I think President Trump is quite rightfully going to uh, try to level tariffs or do away altogether with tariffs and have true free trade as opposed to what appears to be free but is not because it's it's uh, hidden by the, the, the imbalance is hidden by tariffs which were done after the war when Europe was in ruins and America allowed Europe and other countries to put up tariffs against American goods and had low tariffs coming into America to boost the economies but that was years and years ago and those times are long over, and all these nations have done is sponge off America ever since. And this is coming to a halt, because the American taxpayer paid to start with, then inflation, and now, of course, future generations are paying for it through the huge debts that America has run up. $20 trillion on its on its immediate treasury direct debt, and another $100 trillion in, un, in guarantees and unfunded liabilities. But what's going to happen as these tariffs even out, it's going to hurt the economies of a lot of countries. And uh, particularly if you look at Europe, which has not only just agreed to spend more on its NATO spending, but it's going to lose Britain as its second largest contributor. And then it comes to having to equalize its uh, trade tariffs is going to hurt its exports into America. And so that's going to hurt them tremendously and by nature will strengthen the dollar, which will dive up the cost, the servicing costs of these countries' dollar debts, which they've had. And this, then begins to threaten defaults around the world. And it's these defaults that could trigger the, the, this awful moment of a debt collapse. Uh, and let me, let me pick up with, with what John said, because that was in the blog piece last night too, Richard, which is why is this so uh, important for China? Because as, as these tariffs bite or not bite, we can, well, it, this is a very open-ended discussion we could have for, for a long time. Um, the typical Chinese response, coupled with all that debt, is, of course, uh, co come enormous amount of uh, capacity in China. So if China can't sell its goods uh, due to uh, U.S. tariffs, those goods are still going to find their way onto the global market. And the global market is going to suffer under uh, a deluge of, of Chinese uh, production, which is going to deflate prices or push prices lower. And coupled with a higher dollar, a, a lot of the countries that are not involved in the tariff game, but they will suffer because they have dollar liabilities that have to be funded uh, from sales of goods, whether it's uh, raw commodity goods or, uh, or, or processed goods. And when those prices are pushed down through uh, Chinese uh, efforts to sustain their economy, that's going to be a bigger hit to their profitability. And because they have dollar liabilities, they're going to run into severe problems of funding those liabilities. And the issue with debt, of course, debt is great as long as you can service it. But when you can't service your debt because the load becomes so good, so enormous, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, that's when the world stands to get itself into a difficult situation. Yeah, if I could just add to that, I, I totally agree with that. It's a huge, this is the thing that's going to bring uh, on a debt crisis, in my view. Uh, when Ira mentions China and people say, oh my God, fancy taking on China, which all presidents have failed to have the courage to do so far, and think that China's going to win this tariff battle. I mean, China's economy is only 40, is only 60% of the size of the United States. The United States economy is far the biggest in the world. And it would even more illustrated when you talk about Iran. I mean, people, the Europeans now are saying, oh, we want to keep this nuclear agreement, this disgraceful 
uh, and treacherous uh, nuclear agreement uh, going. And Trump has quite correctly faced them by saying, right, you have the choice. You either trade with us, which is the largest economy in the world where you can earn a fortune, or you agree to trade only because we're going to buy you if you trade with Iran. You trade with Iran, which the economy is just over 2% the size of the United States, the 27th largest com economy in the world, just over 2% of the size of the US. So even these Europeans are going to start to have to realize you can't fight America uh, 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 with impunity under this president. You could under all these other presidents, they just caved in. And who paid? The American taxpayer, the American middle class who have been crushed by tax and, uh, and lack, lack of value, and the poor have been kept entirely poor in the United States. So much so, as I said, that students have $1.5 trillion of debt, and you've now got a generation called the Millennials, which has got a poorer house, the first generation of Americans, I think, ever to have a poorer outlook prospects than the future, than the, than the past generation. So the baby boomers are as tough as they find it. The Millennials are going to find it even tougher. Hence, they want a complete revolution, an economic revolution. And you see these tremendous moves, as you mentioned, in New York City of ultra left-wing candidates wanting free help at the cost of 32 trillion and all this sort of thing. They're going to be a huge threat to the political system of America. Uh, and all because of the lack of uh, guts of past presidents. And it's now being exposed by the first president with courage to face the real problems. And yeah, before we get into that on the democratic socialism trend, just wanted to get your thoughts uh, of the uh, the stress in the financial system. Could could we see uh, the next financial crisis emerging from Europe and emerging markets given a, a strengthening dollar? Ira? Yeah, that's what I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, anybody who has dollar uh, funded liabilities is you have a you have a problem now and and it's i was explaining to somebody it's like when everybody you know when everybody was borrowed up in yen uh, because the yen the interest rates were zero but the japanese yen started to rally all of a sudden borrowing at zero didn't matter because if you hadn't hedged those liabilities you had a severe payment problem exactly what happened in europe in uh, uh january 15th uh, I'm sorry, January, yeah, January 15, 2015, when the Swiss pulled the peg because everybody was borrowed uh, up in Swiss francs because, oh, the currency is fixed. Uh, we know it can't go below here. We, we know that the Swiss is holding it at, at uh, 1.20 to the euro. There's a floor there. They've been involved big in maintaining it. I'm going to borrow all I can. It's free money until that peg got pulled and the borrowers got crushed. So there is some, the, the mismatch can really play havoc in the world. But, and I know we're going to jump into this, but let me also pick up where John went with in Europe and problems in Europe. And, you know, when we're in this election cycle, what you have to take notice, and like in the German elections of last year, when were they, September of uh, 2017, and, and this, the standing parties, Merkel, and the uh, Social Democrats under, um, what's his name, who's now gone, uh, they, did, they fared so poorly, even though the, the economy was booming. This is unheard of, mm -hmm. that you've seen so much voter discontent at times of, of uh, relative um, uh, prosperity. The same in the United States. You think that Donald Trump got elected, and the, you know what? The markets were healthy, unemployment is low, the stock market was strong, interest rates were low, and yet the voters threw out the standing politicians. You know, same thing with Brexit. It, these things are taking place, and that's what makes them interesting, is that the voters are showing up to voice this discon, discontent at, at times when the uh, equity markets and financial markets are reflecting at times are, you know, are great. So we have a major disconnect here, which makes this really more interesting. Yes, I agree with Ira, but I think the ones he mentioned in Germany, Brexit and, and Trump, the statistics are indicating that the, the predominant factor in that was not economic, it was immigration. 
which in turn translates into economic because you have to pour social security and rights and everything into these new immigrants. And so it has a bad economic effect, but the immediate cause was immigration. And I think it's switching subtly that the movement that Ira correctly, uh, in my view, uh, I uh, pointed to is changing its focus from immigration, which it was in Germany, uh, Brexit and Trump elections, to economic. And that's the big challenge. It's a huge challenge because if the American growth rate doesn't keep up, even Trump's going to slip slightly on the economy. And he's, thank goodness he's been very strong on immigration, but now he's taking over this crushed generation of millennials who I think many, a large proportion, larger than most people thought was ever possible, voted for Trump in 2016. Uh, the question is whether they will vote a Republican in 2018, and then all the implications, if the Republicans lose control of the, the uh, House particularly, they'll probably gain a few seats in the Senate, but then the House is vulnerable. Um, then you've got all the problems of impeachment and all this sort of stuff, and ever finding these crooks that have been in the leadership of the swamp, ever putting them behind bars will go, uh, vanish. I think it's a terrific threat, not, and, it's not, and it's not even a threat just to Republicans. It's a threat to center of the road Democrats. They're all going to find themselves, although we used to think they were left wing, they're going to look right wing compared to this new wave that I think is, is driven, yeah. hopeless, driven uh, and moving to the left. I mean, all these people we thought were right off the board up in, I've forgotten the senators up in Maine and all these people, you know, the woman who said she was Indian and uh, in, you know, Nancy Pelosi, and now this woman in New York, extreme left, is going to gather uh, traction. And I, that's the real threat in my view. And then how do the Republicans respond to that? One just hopes that the economy stays up long enough to get past the uh, elections of 2018 and 2020 so that Trump can really make the changes that are necessary. Yeah, it seems to be gathering momentum, this movement in uh, democratic socialism, um, where the, uh, the woman you mentioned, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, 28-year-old, uh, yes in New York City uh, has beat in the primary, I, I think it was the 14th con congressional district um, and is, is rising and uh, also uh, providing um, impetus and momentum for others to join in this. Um, there's also been a 280% increase on college campuses for chapters of democratic socialism. Uh, what, what effect could uh, democratic socialism have on the, on the economy uh, of the U.S. and the financial markets in general? Well, I, first of all, I think democratic socialism is a complete misnomer. <laughs> that socialists are not democratic at all. Okay. And, and, and Democrats in America are exposing this. They, they only want free speech as long as it's their speech. That when the democratic president is elected democratically in America, they have totally disloyal resistance. And people like uh, Hillary Clinton and co have never made no attempt and these other leading Democrats Schumer and so on to curb it They go on and now you've got violence those people going to a restaurant just two days ago in Philadelphia Kirk, I think it was a turning point uh, and harassed in a restaurant all egged on by senior Rep uh, Democrats they've done made no effort at all to destroy what should be loyal opposition and is at the moment totally unpatriotic and disloyal resistance to a duly elected president. And I think it's going to get far worse. And that's a big, very big danger. And the big mistake, in my view, is to think that the Democrats are democratic or that socialism is democratic. Socialism, as we saw in Nazi Germany, the National Socialists, we saw in Lenin's Russia. We've seen it all over the world. Socialism is not democratic. It covers itself in democratic camouflage and then becomes dictatorial, which it's becoming in America. Just the, mentioned 280 chapters. You try and go and speak to those uh, if you're a, a Republican. You'll be howled down. You would, might even be physically damaged and certainly barred entry. Uh, they're all springing up just like they did in Germany and in the Soviet Union. All over the way, these little cells, these little Soviets, and they're totally undemocratic. And Ira, your thoughts on this? Well, 
having come from that background, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm I'm young, I'm a little bit younger than John, but I I spent my time on the far left in the late '60s, early '70s, uh, mid for the mid '70s. Okay. So I I understand their their failings, but it's it's a far different time period. I was just having this discussion with somebody that I could sit down with um, with people who were uh, uh, certainly of a, a much different political uh, persuasion than myself, and we would have real discourse. Uh, I could speak uh, every night after I would finish my uh, work in the library when I was a graduate student. I would sit down with a guy who was writing a, uh, a dissertation on uh, Hayek's The Constitution of Liberty, and I would discuss from a Marxist perspective the world, and he had a much more, of course, you know, Austrian uh, Hayekian view of rights. And we, I really learned a lot from him. It, you know, it opened my eyes. I, I, the one thing I agree with John, I, I, that type of discourse is gone. Uh, we, we live in a society, and I think a lot of it has to do with the social media, where people seek validation and not discourse. You learn through discourse. Mm -hmm. You validation is the worst form, but that's what social media does. It just validates from Twitter to face. It's all people seeking validation. It's like I tell my blog readers, I don't care about your validation. Let's argue all day long. You, you've got a point to raise. Let's argue it. If I'm right in my thinking as an investor, the market will validate me. I don't need, I don't need human validation. I want discourse because that's how you really learn. And I'm really, and, and that I really agree with John is that we, we have lost our way. There, there nobody wants discourse. Uh, nobody wants discourse. They, they would just want to be. That's why you know, who do you friend? You friend people who agree with you. Well, that's just an echo chamber. We need. We don't need echo chambers. We need true discussion. Listen, there's there's a lot of, uh, to, of failing in the current. Uh, uh, economic uh, growth period, and we know this for 40 years that wages have not kept up. Now we can discuss from all types of perspectives why. You know, it, we can go to uh, Tomas uh, Piketty, who you know, just to, to uh, filter out and make it simple. You know, R is greater than G, uh, and and it has not filtered down. But you know, I would maintain uh, probably from my own views, but I think that they're correct. Is that when capital is so global, is so mobile around the globe, and is able to chase labor, uh, you are going to get a disproportionate amount of money, of course, that flows to capital versus wa labor, and wages have been have been sticky to the downside. And I think that's a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the ill feelings that have existed. You know, and I'm no fan of. I am a, an anti Davos person, down to the soles of my feet. I I believe that that crowd has done enormous damage. Not because they're capitalists. It's 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 so much more than that. It's that technocratic elitism where they know better than everybody else, and they've been able to, you know, the system has been crafted for them. But this requires true discourse and discussion, not uh, not what's going on. I the, the silencing of opposition. And I don't care who it is. I'm a, you know what? Speak your mind. You got mm -hmm. something to say, and maybe I'll actually learn something. You'll make a good point. So I, I totally agree yeah. with John in in what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, yes, I think the discourse days of the, uh, you know, I'm older, as I said, but I can remember, you know, in the days of Kennedy and people, people in the Democrat Party and the Republican Party did have discourse. They did, and in England, you know the Labour and Conservative parties, I mean, they discussed things. One was always interested to go on trips with Labour people and discuss things and see their view and point of view and so on. And it was a genuine uh, discussion and re resulted in some pretty healthy compromise, although I think both in England and America, the compromise was for an easier life and we steered what were once enormously the richest countries in the world downhill. And we did it largely on debt. And so I'm not so I think the discourse was good, but it was I think people have probably got the better of those arguments with the, with the Democrats and Labour and and the Republicans and Conservatives in England felt guilty about their wealth. And they so they gave in more. 
But now it's something different. Now it's a completely, the, the battle lines have been drawn and I think it's very dangerous to get back to the wealth, which I think is the crucial thing now is this huge wealth gap. I think QE and ZERP are the zero interest stuff has benefited hugely the owners of assets. And of course the owners of assets were usually people who could afford to own them. Most people are living pay packet to pay packet and even rent their houses and everything, even lease their motor cars. They don't own assets. So the asset owners shot up in value and it's now sick. They've gone up 16 times as fast as uh, low income earners. And that's starting from a higher base. So 16 times, you know, 10% of a hundred is 10, 10% of 10 is one. And so the, it, it wasn't yeah. just the 16 times it was on a bigger base. And now you've got a, a few embarrassingly large gap. And as Ira said, although, Business is picking up and turnover is picking up. Still, way and unemployment is dropping fast. Still, wages are not. And I think it's partly to do to the fact and productivity is going up, but still wages are not really rising, which is exacerbating the problem. And I think it's partly due to the huge overdose of quantitative easing and zero interest rates. I, I, I agree with John totally on that. And listen, the Bernanke plan was, and he openly said it in August of 2010, a portfolio balance channel, which was shifting of assets to favor those, a shifting of, of capital to favor those who had assets and that everybody else would benefit. I, I think the toll that the world is paying is great. I think we see it with the Bank of Japan with having no answers how to get out of this. And I think the European Central Bank has the biggest problem of all, but I, but I really still believe that Draghi's um, uh, exit strategy is to build, is to just declare a uh, European uh, bond. It'll make uh, the Davos crowd very happy, and it'll be guaranteed by Germany at all, and and that's where it's going to end. And I think that's the way that they really feel that their exit strategy is. But it has been a disaster for the average person, a disaster. The big question is, will the European Central Bank end QE in December? I think it will, uh, perhaps, but it's, I think, too late. And they've managed to pile up, because of it, the quantitative easing, and because of the debts of countries like Italy that are just huge, and Greece and everyone else, now these countries can start to have to start paying that debt back with, an, with, a, with a tariff barriers go down with a problem. They're going to want to leave, just like Greece tried to, but was squeezed by squeezing the, the, the leaders, rather like Mueller squeezing his, his um, witnesses in the, in the case now, these others were squeezed by the European Union and by the IMF, and the leaders were squeezed to so suddenly, although they'd got in on getting out of Europe in Greece, they suddenly wanted to stay in. But the different story in Italy, Italy still wants to leave. And if England, Britain leaves in March of this coming year, and then Italy starts to leave, uh, the European Union could crumble. And what's yeah. going to happen then, it's going to be bad enough, just Britain leaving. But if others start to leave, what's going to happen to the euro, in which most central banks and most big corporations and investment companies throughout the world have diversified out of the euro, dollar, out of the euro, uh, out of the dollar, into the euro. So massive amounts of their holdings are dominant, denominated in euro. So a collapse of the euro would be potentially catastrophic. I, I stone cold agree. That's exactly right. It will result in a an implosion in uh, the global financial system. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you know, cooler heads prevail. The Italians know their strength. I think those who are squeezing Brexit here are making a gigantic error because they're going to need Britain to help resolve this problem. And the Brits are merely going to be... Uh, Whatever it costs the Brits will be cheap because the, otherwise bailing out the European system, the cost is going to be enormous. Enormous. Yeah, it'll and be worldwide. What? Whatever debt you hold worldwide, it's, it's going to be severely eroded. And uh, yeah. so precious I, I agree. coming to their own. It's going to be. I uh, mean, as, 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 as Einstein said when somebody asked him, what weapons do you think World War Three would be fought with? He said, I cannot tell. Weapons are developing at such a fast rate, it's impossible for me to know. But I can tell you what the war after it will be fought with. It'll be sticks and stones. 
And it's, yeah, a, sim- it's, a, it's a similar thing. Yeah. It's a similar thing to a financial collapse. Richard, I'm going to have to cut off here. Um, oh. I have to do something else. So I'm sorry to be abrupt uh, short oh, yeah. here, but uh, okay. I, John, sure. I enjoyed this immensely yeah. as usual. Me too. Let's do it again. Me too. Okay, uh, John, can you hang on or is, are you okay for another few minutes? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Thank you, Ira. And um, yeah, and, and what about, uh, what do you make in Japan, uh, the Japan uh, Central Bank? Um, looking at buying equities versus bonds, uh, considering, uh, you know, the supply of bonds concerns there. Um, and also, could, could this be a trend, you know, in other banks as uh, uh, central banks look to, um, to maybe uh, purchasing equities? Oh, yes. I think it's disgraceful, of course. It's part of the globalist approach, and I think it is disgraceful. But one's got to remember that these whole things, QE and zero interest rates, which I am not against to avoid a, 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 a financial economic collapse as a short dose. I mean, it's like having morphia when you're in real pain, but you don't want to get the person hooked on the drug, which has happened in a number of cases and it's very dangerous. So I agree with applying that morphia of QE and ZERP, but they've kept it on so long and the inventors of QE and ZERP were the Japanese. And now, of course, unlike America, they're not the reserve currency of the world. They're one of the basket of reserve currencies, but not the reserve currency of the world, which is the U.S. dollar. And uh, so they're unable to print absolutely without limit, as Americans can, but they can print a lot, and they've printed and printed. And now uh, the, the pigeons come home to roost, and they're having to create uh, security and stop people who are realizing the awful things, selling their equities and bonds. And they buy treasury bills. That was one way of doing it, of course, was to expand money. Uh, then they stretched into corporate bonds, which I thought was outrageous, to stretch into bu- spending the people's money buying equities, to me, is, uh, I think, totally irresponsible, except in the most dire of emergencies. So what it signals to me is that the Japanese are seeing, potentially, a dire emergency. And finally, on trade wars, the emerging trade wars globally, how do you see that uh, playing out? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And what could be the effects on the economy and the financial markets? Well, the trade wars have been going on for decades. There's always been trade wars. The question this time is when everybody mouthed the words free trade, they didn't. Uh, mouth the words fair. So when America charges a 2% tariff on a motor car from Germany and Germany charges a 25 to 50% tariff on an American car in Germany, it's hardly fair. And so it, it's technically free, but not really free. It's like having a free race, but you have some people having to carry a hundred pound pack on their backs. Uh, and so Trump has realized that all this a lot of this growth in the world and prosperity in Europe, China, Japan, and everything has been based on unfair tariff regimes. And uh, so he's trying to say, no, the American people, we, we're quite prepared to have fair trade, uh, free trade, as long as it's fair. I'd be prepared to have no tariffs at all, which would be true free trade. That would be great. But America would, of course, benefit, to start with at least, because America's been weighed down. So now it runs in a race without a 100 pound pack on its race, on its back, it suddenly starts winning races. So in this battle has been going on for years and years and American politicians have mealy mouthed, uh, thinking, oh, we've got to keep these countries going to stop the spread of communism and all that, uh, and have uh, allowed it to go on. And Trump's saying, no, we must now, you know, China's now challenging, challenging America, Europe's challenging America. We've now at least got to have fair trade. And so it's going to benefit enormously the United States. And I think the United States is going to win. They're all mouthing antagonistic voices. You just look at Europe. They all say, oh, no, no, we're going to slap huge tariffs on America. And then was it last week or the week before, you know, they come across and they say, well, actually, we sort of agreed, just as they did over NATO. You know, Trump is tough. I mean, he's the only American to stand up, president to stand up for decades against these people. He won over NATO. He's going to win 
in Europe against the Europeans. The big one is China. And China's economy is only 60% the size of that of the United States. So the United States is, if you imagine two boxers and one is 40% is heavier than the other, he's likely to win the fight. And I think America will win the tariff wars. And I think what Ira said, one of the spillouts of it is going to be uh, that the Chinese will finally, even with a face-saving dialogue, will finally sort of agree. And uh, still, as they've got overcapacity, they'll still be spewing out their products at discounts around the world. And that's going to harm a lot of countries that are just making it now. And uh, their trade will be much tougher. They'll be getting less earnings for it and in whatever currency they've got. And at the same time, the dollar is not only there, but likely to go stronger because of this uh, event. And therefore, their debt service is going to be increasingly difficult. And uh, in my view, that's the danger of it, is that it could trigger a financial collapse, which would not be in the interest of anyone. Wow, and we'll end it there on that note. Uh, uh, sorry, Dan. <laughs> yeah, good, no, the, great insight. The uh, thing, yeah. The good thing is that if you're an American, as I am an American citizen, the good thing is that out of the collapse, I think the underlying strength of America is going to mean that America comes out of the bad situation better than anyone else, just as it came out of the Second World War greater than anywhere else. I mean, America is undoubtedly the largest economic power in the world by far. And, uh, you know, when you look at Iran, just 2%, just over 2% of the size of the United States economy. And it is by far the largest or most powerful military power on earth. But military power depends on economic power. And one way of stopping an aggressive power seeker like China seizing more military power is to curb its, its economy by not allowing it to feast on the consumer in the United States. And that's what I think is, is the grand strategy of Trump. And it's very grand because it results in making America great again. Well, great insight as always. John, how can our listeners learn more about your work? Oh, uh, well, I'm a partner in a, in a company. It's very interesting you mentioned that. I find a little company called investorsmonitor.com. And if you look on www.investorsmonitor.com, okay. our website is up on the 20th of August. And that is a company of political, economic, and financial research. And what we're trying to do is present the reader with a, a cooked meal. And, and we have to go and gather the vegetables and the meat and all that sort of thing, get them and cook them and everything, and bring it into sort of pricey form on a very attractive, easy to read website, but if with very easy clicking, if, if an investor like a hedge fund manager wants to look, or we say something about employment, he wants to look down, he just does click into more depth in unemployment figures, and then clicks again into much more un in depth, and finally into the actual figures and analysis of the Department of Labor, or mm -hmm. the Fed, or the mm. F, or whatever. So they'll be able to easily get down to the roots, but they're faced with a price <laughs> And it's targeted really at um, uh, small hedge funds and small money managers that don't have huge de de uh, research departments, mm -hmm. high net worth individuals, and education, because I think it's going to be a marvelous way for professors of economics and finance in universities and schools to teach their, their, uh, their students, because they can, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a um, uh, you know, big screen, they can go through, well, now we look at the, well, today's subject is going to be unemployment figures and we'll say, this is what it looks like on the news and this is what are done at another level and this done at another level and this is the real statistical figures that they're working on. And I think it's going to be a great help in education in understanding these things. Well, wow, that sounds I mean, very interesting. Yeah. com. Great. Well, thank you very much again, John, for being on the show. We'll do it again in the future. Well, thank you, Richard, and thanks to Ira, too. It's, uh, it's lucky that two people with generations apart in age uh, think pretty much along the same lines. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. 
the investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. 